Our second speaker, uh, our second, uh, uh, second speaker is Dominic uh, from the University of Edinburgh. He's going to talk about how to map open potential OPMP programs to OpenZ. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Dominic, and the, the project I'd like to talk about is about how can we map a, a data parallel program to heterogeneous systems. So when I say heterogeneous system, in this case, I mean we have a, a multiple CPU and, and a GPU. So, so I'm sure most of you are aware heterogeneous computing has really become a mainstream recently. As part of that, OpenCL has kind of emerged as a, as a standard that's supported by all the, all the vendors out there. And initially we saw this trend in, in some high performance computing where you have like a dedicated GPU next to a CPU. But with more and more we see it in, in other areas of computing, like desktop or mobile computing, where the, the GPU is often integrated on the same, on the same die as the CPU. So, Heterogeneous computing is really getting into the, into the mainstream, but um, even though we have OpenCL as a language that allows us to, um, to program all these systems, it's not really meant to be used by sort of mainstream, mainstream programmers, right? It's, it's, it's quite a low-level language and you need to know what you're doing. So if you want to make these, these, uh, uh, these systems, heterogeneous systems available to, uh, to mainstream programmers, we, well, we, we uh, kind of have to, to come up with something. So um, I think we have basically two main challenges if we want to do that. The first one is the challenge of, of task mapping. So how do we decide which parts of our program to run on which device? So simply running uh, anything that's data parallel on the GPU is not necessarily a good idea. Um, and or we, can, we can go a step further and maybe use both the CPU and the GPU to work on a single task. But then we need to decide how to, how to partition the work between the different processes. And if you want to go even further, we can look at things like, what if we're in a multi-programmed environment where we have other programs running at the same time? How do we, how do we change our mapping accordingly? Um, the, the, second, the second problem is, or the second challenge is, uh, the one of, of code generation and tuning. As I said, we have OpenCL as a language um, to, to uh, program these kind of systems. But it's very low level, so we really want something something higher level that can be used by, by most programmers. But then we need to essentially generate code that can run on, on CPUs and GPUs. So in, in that sense, OpenCL could serve as kind of more of an intermediate representation or an intermediate language. Um, but if we generate this kind of code, we also need to look at into code tuning because um, GPUs especially are very sensitive to uh, to how how we write the code. So when we generate the code, we have to specifically tune the code for, for the target a device that we, that we want to run this code on. Um, so in, in this paper, we, we looked at, can we, can we use OpenMP as essentially this high-level language and, and map it down to OpenCL? So for those of you who don't know OpenMP, it's a very, very simple, simple way of parallelizing your code. So if you have a loop where all your iterations are independent, you, know, you don't have any dependencies between the loop iterations, you can annotate this loop and say this, is, this loop is parallel. And then the compiler would go and run, or the compiler at one time would go and run this, this code, this loop, uh, across your, your course on the CPU. So that's what's kind of being done today. But we thought, can we, can we take this OpenMP loops and run them also on the GPU? So what we do is we take uh, OpenMP loop and we generate OpenCL code from it and then try and optimize that code for the GPU. So now, so now basically we have two versions. We have the original OpenMP code that can run on the CPU using um, any compiler like GCC. Um, and we have our OpenCL code for the GPU. Um, so now what we do as a, as a next step is we try and predict which of those two versions is going to be faster and, and then uh, run the specific version on the, on the specific device. And we do we do this prediction at runtime because often, even though uh, a, pro uh, a program might be suitable for the GPU, say, um, it, it depends on things like the input size, for example. You know, if you're working if you're working on a small data size, um, often, even though your program is in principle suitable suitable for the GPU, the CPU will be faster simply because of the, the all the overheads you get with GPU computing. Uh, we'll see some examples of that. So the, the way we try to pick a target device is we use both static and dynamic code features. So static code features for things like, um, you know, we, we, we do an analysis of the code and we see things like uh, how many 
how many floating point instructions do we have, how many memory instructions. So this, this essentially tells us sort of, um, things like the memory to communicate, uh, sorry, the compute, computation to communication ratio, things like that. But like I said, it, it also depends on, on runtime factors, so we try to take things like the input size into account. Um, a slightly more detailed overview of our approach is this. So we start with OpenMP, and then we extract the kernel. So this is, is fairly straightforward. For each OpenMP loop, um, we will we'll have one OpenCL kernel. So we, we don't try and merge any loops or things like that. Then we perform a couple of optimizations. So this is things like, um, for example, loop interchange, which will help us uh, improve the memory performance on the GPU. And then we generate OpenCL code. Now, with this open, on this OpenCL code, we do this um, feature extraction that I just talked about, so we extract some, some code features. Um, but instead of making a decision now, we basically take, take all the components that we have, so the OpenMP, OpenCL, and our program features, and stick it all in, in one output program, basically, together with this um, machine learning model, which I'll talk about later, which will help us uh, make this prediction on, on whether OpenMP on the CPU or OpenCL on the GPU will be faster. So one aspect I'd like to talk about is, is optimizing for memory accesses. Um, because when you, when you have an OpenMP program, it's often been optimized for the CPU. And what you want on the CPU, in terms of memory accesses, is kind of like, uh, you could call intra-thread locality. So you have locality within the thread, right? If the CPU loads one element, you also you load the cache line into, into your cache, and then when you access the next element, it's already in the cache. Um, on the GPU, you kind of want the opposite. You want inter-thread locality. So you want consecutive threads accessing uh, consecutive data. Um, so to, to achieve that, you have to do some transformations on your data. So for example, if you have a multidimensional array uh, indexed by, say, i, j, and k, you can sort of change, change the way, change the layout of that array um, so that you, your index might be something like k, j, i, so you reverse the way you access the, the array. Um, now, you can, often you can, you can find a layout that, that uh, is kind of optimal for your program, so that in every loop you achieve this kind of inter-thread locality, but sometimes, sometimes that's not possible. So sometimes there might be, you know, you can pick, you can pick uh, one layout, but it's not going to be optimal for all the, for all the loops in your program. So in that case, we consider doing uh, dynamic, what we call dynamic index reordering. So if you have a set of, a sequence of kernels where um, the, the, the globally chosen layout is not optimal, we do, um, we do a transformation. So um, if you have an array A, you could transform it to an array A prime. So the, the transformation is, is really like a kind of a matrix transpose. So you just change the layout of the data dynamically at runtime. Then you execute your kernels, which now uh, can, can access this uh, array A prime in an optimal way. And, and afterwards, we transform the array back into, into the original layout, because obviously the, the rest of the program assumes that the array is in the, in the uh, globally chosen layout. Now, this transformation is not, is not necessarily always beneficial, right? You have a certain cost of doing this, because you have to do this data transformation. And if the cost is higher than the benefit you get, then obviously this is not a good idea. Um, so let's look at some examples of that. Uh, what we see here is two, two benchmarks. There's um, benchmark BT and SB from the NAS parallel benchmark suite. And we have different input sizes. So in, in this slide and in all the, all the other slides, the input sizes are ordered from the smallest to the largest. And let, if you just focus on the, on the leftmost bar, or set of bars here, um, this is BT, a benchmark BT on the smallest input size. And well, for both BT and SP, we have two code regions where uh, this dynamic index reordering is applicable. So the first code region is this uh, green region here. So this is essentially the time it, uh, it takes to run this region. So you see it's quite, a, it's quite a short region. The second one in blue is, is a lot larger. And then in gray we have the, the rest of the program. So, um, so the leftmost bar is basically that's the, the runtime when we, when we don't perform dynamic index reordering. So that's, that's, basically, sorry, that's basically our baseline. Um, 
And in the second bar, we see the performance that we get when we uh, apply dynamic index reordering to the to the first code region. So you see, well, we can, you can't really see the difference, but the performance only really improves marginally. But we do add some overhead in white here, so that overall our program actually slows down a little bit. So in this case, dynamic index reordering is not really it's not really beneficial. If you look at the second region, however, this is, that's the third bar here. You see that the, the runtime of that of the second code region in blue uh, goes down quite a bit, almost or even more than half. Um, so this time the overhead in white here is uh, is a lot is quite small compared to the to the performance gains that we get. So that overall um, we get a, over sort of around a 25 percent reduction in runtime. So in this case it's it's very beneficial to do that. And we kind of see that across all the other programs and input sizes. So, um, yeah, we, sometimes we, we get a slowdown, so it's sometimes it's not a good idea to, to perform the dynamic index reordering. But often, uh, or so, but sometimes it is. So, uh, in the best case, we get uh, almost a, a five times speed up doing this uh, transformation. So, it, it's really, it's really an, uh, an important transformation to get speed up on the GPU. Um, the, the other aspect, I like, oh no, sorry. Um, so how, how do we decide whether, whether this is uh, performing this transformation is, is a good idea or not? The way we do that is we use a data-driven heuristic because um, it's not really obvious to see whether, whether it's worthwhile or not and also it changes across, uh, it, it changes across architectures. So that's why we, we use a data-driven heuristic that we can just uh, can update when we move to a new system. So our, our heuristic depends on two factors. The first one is the size of the data structure, because basically the cost of doing this transformation depends on the size of the data structure. And then we look at the number of accesses to that data structure, which is basically the, the benefit, right? The, the, the benefit is higher the more accesses we do to that data structure. And we use some simple micro benchmarks to uh, essentially to train our model. So, um, what we do is we have a, a very simple benchmark that where we can just vary the, the size of the data structure and the number of, of accesses to that data structure. And then we, we check whether this transformation is good or not. What we, come, uh, what we get out of it is essentially a, uh, a decision tree like this one here, where, so the first node we look at the access to size ratio, so essentially it says if the access to size or the the benefit to cost, if you like, is, is less than a certain number, we don't perform this transformation. If, however, it is, if it, it is bigger than that, then we also consider the, the data structure size on its own, because often when the data structure is very small, it's not really worthwhile, you know, the, the, the overhead of doing this transformation uh, is too high, so you, you want your data structure to be of a certain size. Okay. The, the other aspect I'd like to talk about is how do we how do we determine whether the CPU or the GPU is going to be faster? So in our case, we do this prediction once for the whole program. Um, so we decide whether we want to run all of the loops on the CPU or on the GPU. Um, the way we do that is we, we use again a, a, a decision tree. Uh, in this case, it's a binary decision tree because it's either CPU or GPU. And as I was mentioning earlier, it is based on on static code features, which are essentially instantiated at runtime. And because we have all these different loops, what we do is we basically just aggregate all that information into one big, what we call feature vector. Um, so the way this decision tree is built, it's, it's kind of a typical machine learning, machine learning approach. Um, so most of you might be familiar with that. Uh, we have a bunch of, of training programs and we perform, for each program we perform training runs. In this case, it really just means run the program on the CPU and run it on the GPU and see which one is faster. Um, at the same time, we do this feature extraction that I just talked about to get um, these program features for each of our training programs. So this way we have, for each training program, we have our features and we know which device is, is the fastest. So we feed all this information into our uh, machine learning algorithm and which outputs, in our case, uh, a decision tree. Okay, now we evaluated this approach on, on 
on, on a number of platforms. So the first two are kind of traditional platforms where you have a, a multiple CPU and a sort of an external dedicated GPU, uh, in the first case NVIDIA, in the case AMD. But we also looked at more, more integrated systems like the AMD, Lano, and, and Intel Ivory Bridge. Um, we considered the, the whole NAS parallel benchmark suite, so that's a suite of eight benchmarks with up to four, uh, sorry, up to five input sites for each, for each benchmark. And we compared our work to, um, first of all, to, to the kind of the most closely related work, which is uh, a tool called OpenMPC, which takes OpenMP and generates CUDA code from it. And, but we also compared it to uh, a handwritten implementation where they took the, the NAS benchmarks and hand implemented them in, in OpenCL. Because, um, well, there are quite a lot of results, and you'll find them in the paper. For, for the talk, I'm just going to focus on, on some of them and focus on the, on the first platform, the Intel plus NVIDIA platform. So, what you see here is um, the performance of the, the first half of the benchmark. So, here you have the different benchmarks and different input sizes. On the y-axis, it's the speed up, in this case, over sequential execution. Um, so if you, if you just focus on BT for now, you see the, the white bar is that's the, the speed up of OpenMP on the CPU. The gray bar is the speed up of the OpenCL on the, on the GPU. And then the blue bar is, is basically the performance of our, of our model. So what you will see is because our model, model either picks the CPU version or the GPU version, the, the blue bar will be either as high as the white or the gray bar. So, if you look at BT with the smallest input size, you see that the CPU is a lot faster than, than the GPU, because it's a very small input size, so copying all the data to the GPU is, is not a good idea, it's, it's a lot of overhead. And um, in this case, our model is able to, to detect that and, and use the CPU. For the for the slightly larger input size, W, we kind of see a similar picture. I mean, the GPU, the speed up of the GPU itself has improved, but the CPU is still faster. But if we look at the largest input size, we see that, the, that now the GPU is, is faster, it's quite significantly, significantly faster than the CPU. And um, so it makes sense to use the GPU in that case. And this is kind of very typical behavior. You see that for, for CG, for example. Initially, the CPU is faster, but once you increase your, your input size, the GPU uh, is able to, to achieve speed ups. So, um, so it really depends on, on the input size, which device you want to use. I mean, there are some, there's, there are some uh, exceptions to that, notably uh, EP, the embarrassing parallel benchmark, where the, the GPU is always faster than the CPU, because there's very little overhead. Um, and and our, our model is able to, to detect, detect that and pick that up and, and just simply use the GPU all the time. Um, these are the other benchmarks, and you see that for some of them, um, for example, IS and LU, the GPU performance is, is quite poor. Um, and actually, when we looked at the, at the handwritten implementation of these benchmarks, we noticed that they completely changed the algorithm. So if you look at LU, for example, in the original OpenMP code, they used um, some sort of pipeline parallelism, which you can't directly map to the GPU. So they, they completely changed the algorithm in the handwritten implementation to, to get performance on the GPU, which is obviously something, something a compiler can't do. Um, so what you see is that overall, oh, sorry. Overall, we get a performance uh, improvement of about 4.7x. That's compared to uh, sort of around, around 2x of the, um, on the CPU. Um, we've also got a, a green bar here, which is what we call the Oracle. So that's basically the performance you get when you always pick the right device. So because, because our approach um, uh, sometimes picks the wrong device, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a gap. But you can see that it's really only, it's very rarely that we, that we don't pick the fastest, or faster of the two devices. So, if you compare our approach to, to, other, um, to the other methods, if we again say, look at BT, you see that OpenMPC, so the OpenMP to CUDA compiler, um, performs quite poorly. There's, it's mainly for two reasons. The first one is they do not perform any, any data transformations. And also, um, 
Well, they, they, they uh, translate the open P code to CUDA and then run it on the GPU, which you've seen is not necessarily a good idea. So I should say that the numbers here are basically average. It's the geometric mean speed up across all the input sizes. Um, SNU does better, but again, because they, they, they always run on the GPU, the performance is not, is not that good. And also, they do not do any dynamic index reordering, uh, which is for BT is quite an important, uh, important optimization. So overall, you see that OpenMPC is, is not doing very well, because mainly, mainly because of, the, of not doing any data transformations. Uh, the the hand-coded implementation of all is doing fairly well, but we're still able to outperform, uh, outperform them because, um, yeah, because of the two things I just mentioned. So the, the data, the dynamic data transformation, as well as being able to pick the right device rather than always using the GPU. So to conclude, we basically uh, looked at those two challenges that I mentioned first. So we we looked at how can we map tasks to devices. In our case, using a machine learning model. And, um, and then generating and optimizing code. So in our case, we, we took OpenMP and generated OpenCL code from it that's tuned for the GPU. And this way, we were able to achieve uh, about a 1.67 times speed up over the original OpenMP code and kind of similar speed up over, over a hand coded OpenCL implementation. Thank you very much. Questions, please? Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I just want to, there's a couple of things I probably want to clarify and I'll probably need to take some students offline. Uh, when I look at the information for your predictive model, you decide where to run it all on your CPU or GPU. Mm -hmm. So this is literally for the entire program, for all the parallel sections, you decide to do it either or. Yes. Uh, don't you think that's a little bit restrictive given? Well, we, we, we had a brief look into um, some more fine grained mapping, but often the or, what we found is generally the overhead of, of just copying the data between the CPU and GPU all the time kind of negates any benefits. Maybe on the, on the more integrated architectures, you can, you can sort of get rid of it. Um, that's certainly something to look at, yes. Well, I mean, that sort of goes towards that. I mean, you are doing at runtime, you're doing the decision. You have a runtime system in there as well. Yes. I mean, you could consider data locality at runtime where to offer or not. Because it, in our experience, what we have seen is that even though a kernel might be better or worse on CPU or GPU, mm -hmm. data locality at runtime is very important. So if you're doing the scheduling at runtime, knowing that you have information of where the data actually is available. And that, that for us, is added a huge influence in the total application performance. So locality in terms of whether it's on, in the GPU memory or in the main memory? Exactly. Okay. Um, and then you, so you people mentioned that OpenMPC doesn't do any data transformations, but if I remember correctly from the 09 paper and the uh, following up work in SC10 and two other works, I mean, matrix transpose, which is a data transformation, which you actually based the a real of the indexes, is one of the transformations that you talk about. <laughs> Oh, the, the, the loop? Um, no, no, not the loops. Loop. They're actually transposing the matrix when, uh, when they are uh, copying data over from the GPU to the, from CPU to GPU. They actually form a matrix transpose in some instances. Okay. Um, well, we, we, we use the tool which is, which is available, right? And we, um, yeah, I, what we noticed is I don't, I don't, well, I don't think we didn't see any, any of those transformations being done. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe they weren't applied for some reasons, but... Um, yeah, there might be some files. Right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm also a senior receiver of uh, Interesting work. Um, I'm curious about your dynamic features. And, uh, well, in particular, uh, first question is, when you did the training, did you uh, leave out the... Um, did you leave out an entire program from the training set, or did you use... Um, yes. You, so you, you did use um, sort of the small data set... Oh, uh, no, 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 no. So, okay. yes, so I guess what you... What you want to know is we, we did the sort of leave one out cross validation, but we what we left out is really the entire the entire program, all the all the data inputs, uh, sorry, all the input sizes for that particular program. So we only used the remaining seven programs in our case to train for the for the left out one. So I'm I'm surprised that it worked quite well this uh, sort of mapping where you uh, sort of figure out 
based, I guess you're using features of the input. And is it basically because, um, you know, uh, those, those applications use sort of very similar uh, inputs or, you know, matrices? Yeah, I mean, we, we did, the, 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 the main feature we used for, for the inputs, when we looked at the input, was really the size of the input. Um, so the, the applications here are um, only, the, the, the runtime only really depends on the size of the input, not so much on the actual data elements of the input. Um, okay. So, and, and yeah, you, you see kind of a similar behavior across, across certain applications that, um, you know, for small input sizes, the GPU is not is, is slow, but then it gets better when you when you increase the input size. Okay. Uh, and one other question: um, in terms of this um, transpose uh, that you were doing, is that are, um, could you have sort of obviated the need for that by uh, new transformations? Well, in, in, in that case, not because. Um, because yeah, you, you could find you could do it for for certain loops, but you have to. I mean, you have to fix the global the global right. layer. So, and if you have lots of loops in your in your code, you know, some loops. Say you have a a, a multi-dimensional array. Some loops only iterate over, say, the x and y dimension, in other words, or y and z. So, it's, in that case, it wasn't possible to to just do loop interchange or something to to um, achieve this uh, uh, interthread locality. All right, um, let's thank the security.